And the, our topic today is can be played the dating in Moscow, Minsk, and Kiev, and cases of materialistic sexual revolution. Uh, so uh, let's have please uh, about 40 45 minutes for presentation, and then we will have some time for uh, comments. Our discussion today is Tatiana uh, Karachu, and uh, then for questions and discussion. Okay. Thank you. Chris, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you interrupt me if I get close to my deadline? Like if I get five minutes before, can someone let, let me know? Okay. Uh, just, oh, yeah. Chris, uh, can you please place the microphone? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. sure, sure. Um, how, how is this? Yeah. That's better. Okay, cool. And you can see me as well. Um, all right, so you see the title, and I'm, uh, this is a paper that I've written together with a former student, Irina Vorobyova, and she's now in Leiden, uh, might be coming back to Moscow, whatever. And uh, this paper is also currently in the revise and resubmit stage, uh, and in addition, I presented it two weeks ago in, in Sweden. So the point is, it's, we're very, very open for feedback now, and this will really go into the next version. And you'll see there are two parts to the title. First one is compensated dating, and the second one, compensated dating as a th the theoretical frame is whether or not it's a case for materialistic sexual revolution. And I should let you know. Yeah. Dear colleagues, can you just switch off your mic because we have uh, very terrible noise from your side. Okay, you turn off Okay, just make waving sounds if you <laughs> if you're saying something. Okay. I, I should admit that there's a question now whether or not we're going to keep this theoretical frame of sexual revolution or whether the paper will deal, deal just simply with compensated dating. So I, I'd be happy to hear your feedback on, on, that, uh, on that issue. Um, but we're going to start with that frame for now. Uh, if we look at the leftist sexual revolutions that especially took place in the West in the, 19, uh, in the 1960s, the 68 movement, or also in Russia you had something similar in early Soviet years in the 1920s, um, however, that was, uh, that was failed. You find something very interesting, and you find that these three spheres of so-called liberation, uh, in terms of rhetoric and discourse, uh, sexual liberation, the intimate sphere, political liberation, the political sphere, and economics, they're all unified, of course, underneath a, a Marxian uh, logic. And so what you had in terms of intimacy, the response uh, in terms of intimacy and sexuality to uh, exploitation, both political and, uh, and economic, was the idea of free love. So uh, people are being exploited, and, and the way to overcome this was e even initially the idea of throwing away marriage and rejecting uh, any price whatsoever on the body so that the body becomes free. Uh, we could put it that way. And, and this was all revolving around, uh, central, central to this as well was the rejection of patriarchy, which was of course linked to the capitalist uh, economic form and political domination as well. So this is how it was, uh, how it was then. Um, didn't last long in the USSR, also arguably didn't last long in, in the West, um, especially in the last few years there have been uh, conservative retrenchments in those societies. But my, my point here is that you see something very different in post-Soviet Russia. Um, here you find instead of sexual liberation, we could talk about sexual liberalization and economic liberalization, and we're not really going to talk about politics because it's unclear what, if anything, has, has, has happened there. But what you find is there is, of course, no rejection of patriarchy. And in fact, patriarchy is still very much central to the economic system and the political system here. Um, but you do find a very interesting mix of sexuality and economics, which is absolutely different from what you found in these um, typical or, 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 say, historical sexual revolutions in the 60s or in the 1920s. And that is as a response to exploitation uh, economic exploitation of, and sexual exploitation of women, the response is not to remove the price of the body, the response is to raise the price of the body. Um, and, and this is because uh, sexuality became uh, uh, liberalized at exactly the same time you have a regrowth and, uh, of economic culture. And you can also find this uh, in terms of links between consumption and luxury consumption and sexuality in, in Russia. So, so the point there is especially that link between sexuality and economics is the opposite from what you found in, other, uh, in, other, um, in the other case. And, and this is really the case of our paper. This is exactly where compensated dating comes in. And that's why compensated dating is interesting. Uh, because uh, it, it's, it's exactly combining these two, two spheres in a very particular way which is opposite to so-called Marxist uh, rhetoric. Um, and so what you find here is that 
um, revolution, and this was even said by Igor Kohn in, in his book on sexual revolution in Russia, revolution is the wrong word to describe uh, what has happened in, also in post-Soviet years. And so key components of so-called Western sexual revolution in Russia were not fulfilled. I have some of these key components listed here, and essentially what you find is this. In Russia, yes, you do find uh, sexuality re-emerging under the public sphere. Um, you find increase in the number of uh, sexual partners, you find people more often engaging in one-night stands, sex becomes liberated from love, but all these other components do not materialize um, in, in the Russian case. There's not, greater gender inequality, there's not greater gender equality, there's no rejection of political patriarchy, there's certainly not an acceptance of alternative sexualities, and, and there's not a rejection of economic of liberal economic order, and so essentially you do not have free love. And again, we're focusing on this last um, can, aspect can here. I, can I, can um, I, yeah. If I just the last one, if I try to understand it, rejection. Uh, can you speak more loudly? Sorry. Yeah, rejection of no free love. Is it right? Uh, no, it's a rejection of economic order, and so in Russia you do not find free love. Ah, you do not. You do not find okay, free love because, in post like, okay. Yeah, you're right. It's a double negative there, and I think thanks for clarifying that. It's re, it's a, you do not find a rejection of economic order. Therefore, you do not find free love, and instead you find the price of love being raised mm -hmm. instead of rejected altogether. Uh, that's the idea here. Um, so some initial infer, some initial data from the survey that we collected is on this idea of sexual revolution uh, more widely. Uh, for example, uh, compared to the 1980s, we find in our survey that women have on average about twice as many lifetime sexual partners today as this data in the 1980s, collect, uh, reported by Cohn. Um, but of course, men still have many more sexual partners. And so, um, well, especially in, in, in Moscow. This is a three-city three survey, Kiev, Minsk, and Moscow. And uh, you find gender equality in the number of sexual partners in Kiev and Minsk, but not, not in Moscow. Another way to report this data is is number of sexual partners by year of sexual maturity. And so what we did, we looked, um, you, you feel welcome to comment if you want. <laughs> um, what we did, we assumed uh, that sexual maturity starts at age 18. And we looked at the number of years the person had and, and basically looked at number of sexual partners per year. And here what you can quickly see is that in nearly every case, uh, younger people are having more sexual partners per year of maturity. And there are two exceptions to this. And that's older um, Kiev women and older Moscow men. Older Moscow men have even more sexual partners on average than compared to younger Moscow men. And this is a theme that's going to come up again and again and again. And it's what we're calling the Moscow, the Moscow effect in our data. Uh, another way you can look at uh, sexual liberation or liberalization, let's say, is the number of one-night stands is sexuality becomes more and more delinked from marriage and more and more delinked from love and from long-term uh, relationships. Um, and here as well you can find a noted, this is the number of one-night stands that a person's reported they've had in their lifetime. And again, you find a very strong uh, Moscow effect, especially with older Moscow men an average of 14 compared to the younger men only having six. And Moscow in general has much more than in any other city. And a third issue here is the idea of sex becoming liberated from, from love, whether or not this is acceptable or not. There was a question about that. Uh, this question was also asked in 1992 uh, in data reported by Igor Kohn. Um, and nowadays we can find that women are more than three times as likely compared to 1992 to say it's okay, sex, sex without love is, is fine. Men are more than twice as likely. Can you can you just a bit uh, more slow? Slowly. Yeah, yeah sure, sure, sure. Okay, no problem. Because it's yeah. interesting. Sorry, when, when I get cannot, it, when, yeah, yeah, when yeah. I get excited. Okay. Uh, so in 1992, uh, today compared to 1992, women are more than. That's a mistake. Uh, women are more than three times as likely today to say that sex without love is okay. Okay, three times. Three okay. times more likely. Um, men today are twice as likely to say that sex without love is, is okay compared to 1992. However, still a lot more men say this is normal compared to women. And here are the actual breakdowns. And again, you find a really strong Moscow effect. It means older Moscow men, 95%, say this is all right. In general, you find twice as many men compared to women uh, saying that this is normal. And particularly, again, in, in Moscow, the numbers are are quite high. So this is just some general background in order to argue that in some dimensions uh, in, in the last uh, 20 years or 30 years, certainly Russia has 
uh, sexual activity in Russia has liberalized, but in other dimensions not, and one of those dimensions is compensated dating. Um, and what do we mean by compensated dating? It has to deal with the question of commodification, and that's uh, commodification is, is the idea of bringing uh, intimacy onto the marketplace. So to which extent has this become more commodified? And the reason we choose compensated dating is that um, it's not commercial sex, and what it is instead is kind of a modification of everyday normal dating. And there's all, already a lot of research on commercial sex which shows that these rates have increased in Russia as well, but our interest is rather uh, whether or not um, everyday dating relationships have also become more commodified. Um, right, so a brief definition of commodification. Uh, it, it can be dichotomized, you know, making decisions more based on calculating based than based on feelings. It's about competition instead of communication, strategizing instead of empathizing. You know this basic uh, dichotomies. But what exactly is compensated dating? It's what it is is when sexual intimacy is given in exchange for particular material company compensation. And there's different words for it. Uh, you can also call it angel cosine, assisted dating, transactional sex, sex, gift for sex exchanges. And the forms, the form of the gift, gift can be really various. There's a lot of different types of gifts. There can be monetary gifts. It can be travel. It can be uh, rent. Um, technology such as an iPhone, luxuries, fur coat, shopping, um, and we've, we've looked at, at nearly all of these. And so what we're doing actually in this, conc in this paper in terms of empirics, there's three basic things we're looking at. First of all, how widespread is compensated dating? Um, because in our, in our earlier research it was qualitative. We looked at online material and we looked at uh, dating websites such as Mambo. And we found the language that people use to describe compensated dating and the way that compensated dating seemed to function theoretically. Uh, but that's a different question. We sort of explore, explore the discourse and the function of compensated dating. But it still rose the question, what, how widespread is it? And that's what this survey was also intending to get at. Um, uh, second, we're also interested in what makes people more likely to engage in this, uh, in, in both receiving and, and giving gifts. And finally, we wanted to compare the three cities, uh, Moscow, Minsk, Kiev, with the idea that Moscow is the most uh, economically developed city, uh, Minsk is the least developed city. Perhaps we find more compensated dating in Moscow, or, or vice versa. You know, if we could invent hypotheses in either direction. Uh, the sample, um, it was an online sample taken from a representative panel. The uh, total number was uh, 678. And uh, if, if you look at the, the sample as it exists in, in that panel and compare it across the actual populations in the, in the three cities, you'll see that the sample is pretty representative. Um, what we did though, we split especially into two different age groups. So that's really the measure of artificiality that we jumped, that we brought in there. We wanted 50% uh, in 18 to 35 age group, 50% in the 36 to 55 age group. Um, and of course, half males and half females, and and a third in, in each city. Uh, we can talk more about that if you have uh, if you have questions. A condition to take place to take part in the survey was uh, that a person has had experience in sexual relationships, and we only rejected uh, one percent of respondents who did not have any uh, sexual experience. So they they were kind of kicked out. Um, overall, we find that most of the respondents have higher education. Um, most of them are, are working full-time, 65%. Some of them are working and studying. Uh, half of them are married, and 80% of them had an intimate. By the way, when I'm saying intimate here, it means sexual, and it was defined as sexual in the survey. 80% of them were involved in a relationship at the time of the survey. But by the way, in relation to the sample, in case you're wondering, internet penetrations in these three cities are extremely high, um, especially if we're looking at the, the, the age categories beneath age 55. Uh, so we don't think our sample is too skewed because it was an internet sample in, in this way, because um, most of the population is uh, does have internet ac internet access in these three cities. Okay. Um, some hypotheses uh, in terms of descriptive statistics. We didn't expect that compensated dating would be any more than a niche practice practiced by a few people. Um, and let's just throw a number, ten percent. I don't know where I got the number, ten percent, but I certainly didn't expect expect it would be as widespread as, as what we found, actually. Um, what would we expect in terms of the logistic regression models that men and women, men and women in terms of gift, gift exchange have a very gendered pattern. Men give gifts, women receive them. We expected that generally people engaged in this might have more individualistic, uh, individualized values, might be of higher incomes, um, and in general, as, as I explained earlier, that the people uh, doing this in general have uh, um, 
more liberalized sexual activity. So, um, and then finally, yeah, as I mentioned, we expect this to be higher in Moscow, at least widespread in Minsk. Okay, overall, this is what we find. Um, this is actually thir about 30% of people um, in the overall sample said that they had either given or received gifts explicitly in exchange for sex. And this is after we kicked out, this is after we kicked out dinner and romantic gifts like flour or chocolates. Because those, you know, are, are more controversial and we could argue that, oh, they happen in every society. We even kicked them out. If you leave them in, it's about, uh, it's 40 or 50 percent even. Um, however, th there, there's a problem with this, and this is something we're working on for the revision. Uh, again, my age distributions are 50 percent, 50 percent. This is not equal to the actual age distributions in societies. So we need to weight these outcomes, and we also need to look at it by city. So this is clearly a next step that we have to take in terms of reporting these overall numbers. but. Um, for sure what we can see, say from this, because I, I, I know the data, but this is much, much more than just a niche of practice. The numbers are quite, quite large. And what this means as well, we had two questions, and this is important to realize. One question was, have you ever exchanged any of these following items, or they could, they could write other and list something. Have you ever exchanged any of these fo following items, uh, no, sorry, have you ever received or given any of them um, with nothing expected in return? Pure gifts, so-called, right? Um, the second question, have you ever given or received any of these, and there are two separate questions, um, explicitly in exchange yeah. for sex. So what we're reporting here are those who say it's explicitly in exchange for sex. That's important. Chris, okay. uh, um, yeah, what we happened? Had, we had a problem. They uh, lost uh, the contact. Oh, we lost the contact. Can we try okay. to contact them again?